Welcome in, everybody, to the flagship podcast. I am Chip Brown of Horns 24-7, joined, as always, by our fearless leader, the managing editor of Horns 24-7, the one and only Taylor Estes. Taylor, how are you doing? Chip, I am doing you know, perfectly fine. There's some big news out of Texas that we're going to get to here um, on the flagship podcast, but overall, I'm doing well. How are you doing? Well, I'm doing fine. Basketball season starts tomorrow. Oh, no. I'm hey, kidding. something exciting to be there. Something to look forward to, maybe for Texas fans. <laughs> I actually am looking forward to it. And you know what's funny? Tom Penders always used to tell me when football's having a tough season, basketball better have a good season mm -hmm. uh, because Texas fans, they're a proud bunch. Um, they like to be front runners, they don't <laughs> like to be college. Uh, sports pinatas like they've been feeling mm -hmm. here for the last uh oh decade in fact one of the funnier moments today from the player interviews was moro ajomo talking about how he was giving michael huff grief and saying okay what happened back in 2010 to curse this program for the next decade <laughs> and it was funny, but it wasn't. I mean, what did Huff say? What was his answer? Well, he didn't tell us what <laughs> Huff said. He just said, because it's been it's been rough and it has been rough and it's it's been really rough this season. Obviously, we we talked after the Texas Iowa State game uh, about everything that went wrong in that game. And uh, we talked about how Josh Moore didn't start that game. He came in in the second quarter, made a big play, had a uh, took a two yard slant, took it 24 yards on third and seven to extend Texas's only scoring drive in that game. And um, today uh, we were reported and Steve Sarkeesian confirmed that Josh Moore has left the team, uh, is now in the transfer portal. And Taylor is leaving with three games left to play. I mean, right. this is... I think that's the part that that kind of surprised some people. If he, you know, he had the blow up with Steve Sarkeesian at Wednesday's practice last week. I'm told he cleared out his locker um, and, you know, was pretty much done at that point. But teammates talked him uh, back into rejoining the team. He did. Obviously, he went to Iowa State. He played. Uh, but he is in the transfer portal and he's done. So that's alarming. This is one of your top three receivers and his teammates today said nice things about him, said he was a good teammate, that they liked him. They wish him well. Uh, but this, when you stack that on top of the four straight losses, um, it's alarming. And last yeah. week he also had the Jeff Banks, you know, situation let's let's say uh with his girlfriend and their monkey um emotional support monkey gia uh and the biting of a you know gia's biting of a a child on halloween and and that right. blew up uh and served as a distraction and and for fans watching this from the outside taylor they think the house is burning right and and obviously you go to Steve Sarkeesian on Mondays to, to, to try to find out what he's learned about his team and what he can do and the coaching staff can do to help uh, fix this team. You know, Gary Patterson, my favorite quote from Gary Patterson is a good coach is some, is someone who can fix a problem fast. Right. And, and right now, Texas fans are hearing more problems and, and the players look, the players are saying the right thing. Cade Brewer, the, the super senior tight end, uh, who was a captain this past game said, we got to have more fun. We got to play loose and have fun. We've we're forgetting about that. It's still a game we love. Uh, and for these players, Taylor, these last four games have felt like a year. Yeah, and I and I think that's how fans probably feel too. And there's kind of, you know, the 
house is burning mentality, fire everyone season is pretty much what Texas is going through and has been going through for the last month, dating back to the Oklahoma game, you know, and Chip, the the one thing that I always look at when whenever a head, new head coach and new coaching staff comes in, you almost certainly are going to expect attrition from the roster. I mean, it's just how it goes. And I think, you know, you said this um, on Saturday after the podcast, and I was glad that you said this, but, you know, when, when you reported last week about Joshua Moore having the blow up with Steve Sarkeesian, there were some people, including another um, media outlet that was kind of questioning, saying that that should have never been reported. But this is why it was reported, because little things like that add up. And I, you know, when the new head coach comes in, you're going to expect there to be ups and downs. You're going to expect some players not to get along with the head coach or the coaching staff in general, honestly, you know, because they're not the guys that they have relationships with. There's so many things that go into um, a head coaching change in a takeover of a program for an entirely new coaching staff. Um, Texas really hasn't had that much thus far. This is, um, I mean, they lost Jake Smith, you know, um, back in the spring and then Malcolm Epps also too, but there really hasn't been a ton that I think a lot of times you expect in year one of a new coaching staff. But um, this one, it's it's the, the surprise to me is there's really no point to quit the team mid season. It's not like Moore can go transfer somewhere else and start playing immediately. So he just quit the team. Essentially. That is the surprising thing that I think with, you know, three games left on the year. I mean, why not ride it out? But this could be, you know, sadly a positive because if there's, if there's some people that are blowing up at the coaching staff and saying, you know, taking um, them being uh, demanding or being, you know, tough, knows, but they do it to make them better. If they take that as a personal attack and blow up on the coach, that's a loose cannon. That's somebody in the locker room that you have to be kind of concerned about. And so I think that not saying that Texas wants to lose Josh Moore, this is obviously a huge hit, especially at a position that cannot really afford to lose many starters at. But I will say that, you know, sometimes um, some roster attrition may actually benefit the future of a program. And if Josh Moore has been that unhappy to where he had, you know, a verbal argument that was seriously enough to, for us to report it, you know, it wasn't just some, uh, disagreement. It was, a you know, then that could be something that could hurt the locker room if it continued. So, um, there's a lot, I mean, it's not the position you want it to be happening to. I think if you're a Texas fan, but I don't necessarily think that you look at this and think the world is, you know, up in flames or Texas football program is up in flames. I think it's just the matter of these coaches are going to be the way that they are. And these players may not like it and they may have to go somewhere else. But that's that's what happens. And that's why the transfer portal is there. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting because there's a lot of comparison going on right now between, um, you know, the first year of coaches, because now. Steve Sarkeesian's the first Texas head coach ever, like in all 31 of Texas's head coaches to lose four straight games in his debut season. Um, but Charlie Strong and uh, Tom Herman, I believe, were both four and five uh, after their first nine games. So um, it's, you know, it's not what, everyone expected. I mean, Steve Sarkeesian himself was saying after the OU game, I hope we face them again um, in the big 12 title game. Yeah, and, and when he was asked about the prognosis for Jordan Whittington, the um, sophomore receiver, who's who broke his clavicle in the fourth quarter of the Oklahoma game, uh, Steve Sarkeesian said of his possible timetable, you know, we're hoping he could be back for a, a big 12 title game or a bowl game. So, you know, after that 55, 48 lost OU, there was, you know, still a lot of hope for this team that they could do something special, make a run uh, by Steve Sarkeesian. He was expressing that. And at the time you, you thought it was plausible because yeah, Texas, led that game. I'm, I put together the numbers, Taylor. This is, this is not what Texas fans want to hear. They led the OU game for 42 minutes and 21 seconds. Um, OU led it for seven minutes and 25 seconds and OU wins the game. 
Uh, Texas led Oklahoma State for 52 minutes and 31 seconds. They held the lead for 52 minutes and 31 seconds and lost the game. They held the lead um, against uh, Baylor for 43 minutes and 38 seconds of the 60 and lost the game. I mean, that's that's the good and the bad. The good is right. this team is good enough to not only get the lead, but dominate, you know, control the game for three quarters of the game. Right. But then has this, you know, deficiency, this, this computer chip uh, malfunction that, uh, that causes them, you know, to lose games. Now against Iowa state, they led, uh, in the first half for seven minutes and 44 seconds compared to Iowa state leading it for seven minutes at halftime. You thought, okay, well, Texas is playing great defense. They're going to grind it out. And then, uh, the, the collapse started earlier than normal. It started in the third quarter and Iowa state obviously went on to, to 27 straight, uh, unanswered points in a 30 to seven win. And so, you know, first years, and Moro Jomo reminded us of this today. He said, I'm on my third position coach in three years. Yeah. There's been so much transition. And third defensive coordinator, too. In right. Three third years. defensive coordinator. Um, same with, I mean, the offense Offensive had, coordinator. Mm -hmm. you know, Tim Beck, Mike Yursich. It, it's, there's new systems, new schemes. And, you know, no one wants to hear that now because, well, wait a minute. You just said they let OU for, you know, 42 minutes. You're not, you weren't talking about different systems and different schemes then. Right. And, and I get it. It's a, it's a cruel riddle. I said that to a, a UT administrator. I said, can you all come up with any more, you can't make this bleep up seasons for us? Yeah. I mean, how crazy is it that, you know, Texas has led dominated three of the four teams it's lost to they're all ranked they're all quality opponents i mean oklahoma state we know legit defense we know iowa state's got a legit defense oklahoma has uh the kraken i mean texas was going to beat them by 30 if spencer rattler stayed in the game but now caleb williams um you know lincoln riley went to his bench and unleashed the kraken right and so you know it's it's just this weird cruel riddle the way that Texas is losing. But the, the alarming part is you lose to Iowa state. The offense was terrible. And now we know that Casey Thompson's thumb uh, has been an issue and that he's, you know, worked hard to, to get it warm. But uh, I heard he had an issue with it last week when it was cold in Austin and he had an issue with it, obviously when it was cold in Ames. Mm -hmm. um, and so, that's going to be something that they're going to have to monitor um, because right now we don't know who the starting quarterback is going to be for Texas against Kansas and, and Taylor it's Kansas week, which I think every Texas fan is like, okay, finally, finally we right. get a reprieve from, you know, this onslaught of ranked opponents or, you know, Iowa State was the preseason favorite to play OU in the Big 12 title game and actually controls its own destiny once again because they did beat Oklahoma State. So, uh, and they haven't played OU yet, but it's, you know, people are looking for positives. Texas right. fans and I'm sure Texas coaches are looking for positives and everywhere you turn. B. John Robinson has a neck strain. Roshan Johnson has turf toe. DeMarvin Overshawn has a, a sore, you know, a, a injured ankle. Right. These are big time players for this team. The quarterback has a thumb injury. Uh, it's it's hard to find the positives right now. I mean, Steve Sarkeesian is having to hold this this team together. Well, I mean, I think that there there definitely are some positives, and I think if you are a Texas fan, look at the future. Don't I mean, right now this is anytime a new head coach comes in, anytime a new coaching staff comes in, it's going to be a transition year, whether it's a rebuild or not. I know that Steve Sarkeesian's never really talked about being a rebuild, but there's going it's a transition year. And so if but if you look to the future for Texas right now, if Texas fans are grasping for any, you know, signs of hope, 
it's what they're doing in the recruiting class. Right now, Texas has the um, number seven national ranked recruiting class for 2022, according to 24-7 Sports Composite Team Ratings. They're the number one class in the Big 12, and there's still a lot of players out there that Texas is well in the mix with that could really, really booster this or bolster this re recruiting class in 2022. And, you know, that that's what you have to look at right now. Um, you have to look at what the future holds, because if you want to dig into all the stats right now, if you want to dig into the negatives, then you're going to probably just be pissed off all the time if you're a Texas fan. But, you know, I, and I know no Texas fan wants to hear that. No Texas fan wants to hear that there's going to be, you know, a letdown a year. And that's exactly what this is for Texas. But Steve Sarkeesian staff is doing a really good job recruiting. Um, I think that one thing you can point to from a positive chip is I do feel like the defense has gotten better each game. Um, I know they, they haven't been great. Let me, let me preface that. But you have seen a lot of improvements. You've seen um, fewer missed tackles. You mean, I, mean, I know it's mainly in the first half of games, but still, I mean, there has been uh, substantial improvements, I think, each week on defense. So that's a positive, too, because you need a good defense in the Big 12. But, I mean, yeah, I mean, if you look at this season, sure, it's going to be a letdown, no doubt about it. But it's well, not impacting recruiting, point, though, either. Though that's Xavier the Worthy. You know, yeah. ties Roy Williams' freshman touchdowns record right. with eight touchdown only, receptions. Yeah, Roy Williams that's the only high top. school. Yeah, that's the only high school recruit Sark signed, right? At Texas. Right. I mean, yeah. If, if that's the kind of talent that Steve Sarkeesian is going to bring in, then let's go. Right. And, and Xavier Worthy has been a highlight, really. He leads the Big 12 in touchdown receptions and uh, scored his eighth and uh, record-tying touchdown against Iowa State on Saturday night. Um, he's he's part of the future. He's, right. he's a guy who needs to be <laughs> a host on a lot of recruiting trips. Yeah. I mean, he may end up. You know, they may have him host every uh, recruit coming on campus uh, and they've got recruits coming in this weekend. Make sure you listen to the Recruiting Matters podcast with State of Recruiting, or yeah. State of Recruiting, sorry, um, with uh, Mike Roach. And <laughs> I'm like listening to you saying and recruiting matters. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> recruiting does matter, but it is it the uh, State of Recruiting uh, mm -hmm. podcast with Mike Roach and Nick Harris. Make sure you're checking that out uh, on the Horns 24 seven platform, along with the blitz with Jeff Howe and Rod Babers. But right. I mean, if, if that's the kind of talent that Steve Sarkeesian is bringing in and look, they've got commitments from some really talented defensive linemen and that's huge. You've got to fortify the trenches. We've told you that they're going to go into the portal um, for offensive linemen. They're not going to talk about that until after signing day in December, but they know they're not mm -hmm. dumb. They know where right. they're going to have to build. And they've got some seniors, um, their upper class, when I should say Denzel Oak for Derek Kerstetter, uh, will be leaving, but, um, you know, it's, it, you're right. I mean, that's the hard part. Texas fans are tired of, and they're really tired of hearing could be big 12 title game. Oh, wait, now it's wait till next year. I get it. But, you got to you got to see what this staff can do in in terms right. of recruiting talent to campus. Yeah. So one thing I'm I'm gonna uh, give a shout out to the Texas stat master uh, Kyle Umlang for this one, but he tweeted this over the weekend, and I thought this is relevant to talking about um, you know Steve Sarkeesian being the the uh, first of the 31 head football coaches to lose four straight games. Um, so in the last 40 years, there's only been one head coach in, at Texas in year one that did not lose five games in his first season, and that was Mac Brown. So in 40 years, however many coaches span in that time frame, every single coach at Texas has lost at least five games in their first season at Texas. So people want to talk about, oh, we used to be a powerhouse. We used to be this. We used to be that. Well, Y'all also used to have head coaches that came in and all lost five games in their first year. So this really not out of the normal. Apparently, the the, the thing that was abnormal was Mac Brown, as, essentially. You know, I mean, and he he made Texas fans have hope every year that they can compete because he was that good and his teams were that good. And it's fallen off, you know, since 2010, obviously, and has never really rebuilt back to what it used to be. 
But what you're seeing now, historically speaking, really isn't outside of the norm for what Texas has actually done in first year head coaches in the last 40 years. Yeah. And um, I remember writing a story about, um, you know, comparing John Makovic's best players and Mac Brown's best players. And Mac inherited good players from John Makovic, Ricky Williams, mm -hmm. Casey Hampton, Sean Rogers, uh, all went on to, I mean, Casey Hampton might be the best player ever to play at Texas, led the team in tackles twice as a defensive lineman, won two Super Bowls, unbelievable talent. Um, and that's saying a lot because I just mentioned Ricky Williams' name, but that's that Steve Sarkeesian needs to get his guys in. And yeah. look, when you're leading games against top 10 opponents for 42 and 52 minutes, um, your fans think you're going to win the game and then you don't win the game. It's a gut punch. It, it's almost worse, Taylor, than, yeah. than playing a back and forth seesaw game like they did against TCU. Um, it's almost worse to lead for 52 minutes and then, you know, and have a 21 point lead and an 18 point lead in the third quarter and, and lose because you just, your heart's broken. Your heart yeah, gets I'm, smashed. Well, and the thing that's sad for Texas fans is it's not, that's not unusual. It happened last year. I mean, Texas against Iowa state, Texas, if they could have won that game, they would have probably played for the big 12 title. And uh, they led for, I think, 58 minutes and 30 seconds of that game, only to yeah, lose it was, in the last minute and 30 seconds. So yeah, that, that was a home game. Yeah. And that's, I think that that's probably where Texas fans are just even more exhausted from what's going on because it has happened. I mean, think, go back to 2018, even after that 2018 season, you know, everyone thought like, oh, wow, Texas could actually make a run. They just beat Georgia in the Sugar Bowl. That was a talented Georgia team. They demolished them. You know, the scoreboard didn't even show how how um, well Texas handled and manhandled Georgia in that game, honestly. But then, they, you know, 2019, all the fans had all this, like, excitement, hype, even though they weren't looking at the fact that they were replacing nine starters on defense. But then 2019 happens, and it's a letdown year. And then 2020, they have a chance to win. They, that Texas had no reason not to win or play for a Big 12 title in 2020, especially with COVID. I mean, honestly, it actually helped them probably, that COVID hit. And uh, then, you know, they fall. They still had the hope at the end of the season. And then they let it down in the last minute and 30 seconds against Iowa State. So this is just kind of – and, and that, that's where I kind of go back to Chip also is – when we talk about getting, you know, Sarkeesian's players in, and these coaches' players and the recruits, the type of guys that they look for, when the player fans are apathetic, obviously, right now about the team being let down, how do you think the players feel? And when the players have been on the roster since 2019, 2020, now 2021, they've gone through all that letdown. That's where that whole thing we've been talking about, the here we go again type of mentality sets in because it's already ingrained into their body. It's ingrained into their mind. It's ingrained into their, their metal. And honestly, that's not something that Steve Sarkeesian is going to really erase until he gets more guys that don't have that mentality in the program. And, and that's I'm not trying to like knock Texas players at all. It's the experiences that they have gone through that I think has led to you know, Texas essentially leading for probably 70% of games this season only to lose it. I mean, that's to lose a lot of them, you know, that's, that's, um, it, that's where the whole, this is, it's just like another season, you know, just, oh, here we go. This is exactly what happens every year with us. And that's what these players have been used to. And honestly, that's where you kind of wonder, you know, getting some fresh blood in there, getting some of the guys that's been around that have helped the program a lot, you know, maybe, out of the locker room, it could actually benefit in the long run. Um, just because I think right now it's very obvious that this team is not very mentally tough. Um, maybe not even physically tough, but definitely is lacking some mental toughness, I think. And you're seeing well, that in and, games. And and I think the coaches have to, you know, I think Steve Sarkeesian, he addressed it again today, uh, saying that, you know, we have to continue to be aggressive. I felt like he was talking to himself mm -hmm. because there's no doubt that the coaches have changed their you know mentality when they've had these third quarter leads they have called plays that have been more safe or right you know less um aggressive um the blitzing tends to go down and 
and they've got to keep playing. I mean, I don't know what they thought with regard to the opponents um, because, you know, Oklahoma certainly has been, I mean, they're the six time defending big 12 champion, Oklahoma state uh, great defense. Baylor's been the surprise team. That's, that's the game. I'm sure Texas players and coaches feel like they absolutely let, you know, get away from them, right. uh, especially with that failed fake punt in the, in the fourth quarter. But the the coaches have to call the game as if they're still trying to attack. And, you know, Iowa state throws a double pass in the second half. Where's Texas's. We know that Roshan Johnson can throw a pass. Now he's got turf toe. Um, we know they've got gadgets and mm-hmm. plays that they haven't been using. And if I'm Bijan Robinson, I'm, I'm going to the coaches and saying, Hey, you know, quit expecting me to run outside zone against everybody. They've seen it. They know when right. it's coming. We've got to dress this stuff up. We've got to, you know, we got to, you know, every week we come on the flagship podcast and say, why isn't Sark running his quarterback at least a little? Right. I mean, Chandler Morris comes in for TCU, Chad Morris's son. Uh, they bench Max Duggan and Chandler Morris you know, runs all over the place and they beat Baylor last right. week with Jerry kill at, at quarterback. And Steve Sarkeesian tells us quarterbacks, keep your eyes downfield, keep your eyes downfield. I mean, it's the last thing for them to think run. I mean, if you're going to run, you've got to decide you can't keep your eyes downfield. You got to decide and you got to run. Right. Uh, and so it, you know, some of these runs look terrible from Texas quarterbacks because they've been told, run as your last option, keep your eyes downfield to make the play. Well, and that's what I was going to say, like how much of it is like Steve Sarkeesian doesn't trust them to run too. And that's, I I mean, every quarterback in the big 12 runs, except Texas is, you know, Mm it's just, it just, um, wait, Kansas. Oh my gosh. Jason Bean. I don't know if he's still going to be the quarterback because they, they moved to, uh, uh, the Daniels kid, Jalen Daniels, last week against K State, but Jason Bean has run it ninety-one times <laughs> at Kansas, and he's fast. <laughs> I mean, he and we know Texas has had some struggles with running quarterbacks. So I was just gonna say that, like, yikes. <laughs> I'm just saying, but yeah, I I think no one wants to hear this, um, but basketball season <laughs> <laughs> well before but, so one thing <laughs> that's talking about the quarterback Steve Sarkeesian was asked today about who you know if Casey Thompson will be the starter if he's named a starter for the Kansas game and he said that he has not you know they'll continue to assess the position um as of right now no starter has been named but Chip you know you mentioned this a little bit earlier about Casey Thompson's thumb um that he injured against Baylor um that you know, Steve Sarkeesian did today admit that maybe that's been hindering him a little bit. So, um, I mean, do you think that's something that's going to keep him out of the game potentially? Well, I think what we've seen and I, from what I'm told, he, you know, he obviously injured the thumb early in the OU game. He, he played through it. Um, he did aggravate it in the Baylor game. He, Mm -hmm. he clanged his thumb on a, on a helmet, on a follow through, And it swelled up and he did not practice last Monday. I'm also told he didn't practice the previous Monday. So the thumb has been an issue. Um, And then in the cold, it didn't, it, it got tight and he couldn't warm it up. He had a, I was watching him in warmups and I'm like, why does he have the little hand warmer thing around his waist? It's 60 degrees, but he had one of those little uh, heated, rosin bags or whatever oh yeah to try to you know get his hand um loosened up so that he could grip the football but obviously he couldn't grip the football he was throwing what looked like water balloons out there bouncing passes to his receivers and sark you know pulls them out so i do think it's going to be a factor this week we have to watch and see how that thumb progresses um because i know I know Casey Thompson wants to play, 
Right. And the question is, does the training staff say, ah, we need to give you some rest or something? Um, I just, you know, that that's a, it's going to be an interesting decision because how much of what Sar Steve Sarkeesian was saying today is evaluating, you know, he said, we, we're going to have to evaluate it this week. Is he evaluating Casey's thumb and, and Casey's performance, or is he evaluating an opportunity to give Hudson card another chance as the quarterback at Texas? So um, right now that's a little unclear and, mm -hmm. and, you know, Steve Sarkeesian's the guy. I mean, he's, this is offense is his thing. So uh, everybody's watching to see how that plays out. But, um, you know, Bijan Robinson with that stinger, remember when Cedric Benson had a stinger, it took him a while to get over it. Now, I, I don't know. It, those, those injuries like hamstrings and ankles are tricky because they can linger. And, right. and so, man, you imagine where Texas would be without Bijan Robinson this season no. and yeah. Xavier worthy, but, um, Xavier worthy. Well, the good thing is fine. there's no, yeah, there's no, they, you don't need to worry about that because that's not the case. And Steve Sarkeesian did say that Bijan Robinson, uh, DeMarvian over Sean, Alfred Collins were all day to day. He didn't think that any of their injuries suffered in the Iowa state game, um, were significant. And so they're going through rehab right now, but no, um, decision on if they'll play for sure or not, but it sounds like it's not as serious according to the way he said it. I thought, yeah. All right, Taylor. Well, um, basketball, basketball season right? does start Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. And, and just real quickly, um, because both the men's and women's teams will, will debut back to back on Tuesday. Uh, the women will play at five 30 against new Orleans. Um, they're, a a top 25 preseason ranked team. They lost a lot of scoring, including the number one pick in the WNBA draft, Charlie Collier. Uh, and Vic Schaefer said, listen, we got a lot of young players. We got some transfers. It's going to take a minute for them to learn our culture, but these are great athletes who are going to learn to play that, you know, 40 minutes of hell defense that he preaches. The Texas men, I'm so excited to watch these guys again. We got to see them in an exhibition game last week and, you know, the thing that, that stands out is the versatility of, of this, this group of players. I mean, they're a collection of transfers and newcomers, um, but they're efficient. It appears that the seven newcomers and the six holdovers are, are meshing well together. And, and Chris Beard has put so much time into team building. Yeah. You know, whether... That's what I was going to ask you, like, how, how does that mesh? you know, with him building this team, obviously they did a really good job in the transfer portal. Um, but you know, how is he doing in building the actual team with having so many different pieces from different puzzles? Well, I think it's, I think it's interesting because Dick Tomey, who was a huge figure in Texas winning the 2005 national championship. And Tomey was here in 2004 when Texas beat Michigan in the Rose bowl and, and, you know, started the run, um, you know, Dick Tomey at that time was the all time, uh, victories leader at both Hawaii and Arizona, uh, those football programs. And he made Mac sit his players down with their position coach and tell their story so that they really got to know each other, um, about what they'd been through in their lives. And you learn that, you know, a player may have had a sibling who died or, a a parent who, who died or, you know, cancer in their family or an assistant coach, their position coach, who's, you know, gone through a painful divorce or just lost a loved one. Chris Beard took the team on a retreat a few weeks ago out to a campfire, no cell phones, you know, campground. It, there was a campfire, but they stayed in cabins mm -hmm. and they sat and told each other their stories. And that's where, you know, the team learned about Timmy Allen's mom passing away when he was 16 and him having, you know, she was his best friend and um, worked two jobs. And, you know, he still gets tears in his eyes talking about her. And, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of stuff is just so smart. I mean, it sounds so obvious, but when you sit there around a campfire and tell each other's, you know, tell your story to someone else and, 
you really get to know who you're you're you know going uh to battle with i just think that is it's so obvious but it's i i it's critical because as chris beard said we're going up against gonzaga on the 13th of november or uh yeah this weekend mm -hmm. and um and he he said they've been together for years right we, we've been together for weeks you know we've got catching up to do and i just think beard thinks of everything it's not just about and he said this past week we've got the talent everyone knows talent is not going to be an issue for us it's about you know playing together playing connected and and the details so i'm excited to see this team um not only against houston baptist in the opener but obviously against gonzaga this weekend yeah. so well and that that does seem really smart i would feel like especially for a basketball program you know what i mean i mean there's so many so fewer players on the team and so you definitely want to make sure that they're connected um because there's only what how, how many players are usually on like 11 or 12. yeah 13. yeah 13. so um i mean that that's really smart and i i'm curious chip and i don't know if you if he's done this elsewhere but is that something he does on an annual basis since basketball a lot of times has you know annual turnover um with players like leaving early for the nba yeah i from what i'm told um you know he, he'll do it every other year or every few years when when he does have a big changeover and and so i think he um you know wisely did it now and and i i i you know i was in kansas city for big 12 basketball media days got to spend some time with marcus carr the point guard transfer from minnesota and timmy allen the the uh, power forward who transferred from utah and i watched beard interact with those guys and joke with them about you know ted lasso and 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 how he calls one of the student managers dumbbells because he's so muscled up you know i mean <laughs> it's uh the, he just has a, a great way of connecting and bill self i asked bill self about um chris beard because chris beard was at um you know seminal junior college and um you know bill bill self recruited players from chris beard when he was a juco coach mm -hmm. and and bill self said i held chris beard's daughter when she was six months old you know i've known this guy forever and he said the one thing that told me then that you know he would be a, a good head coach was the way he connected with his players he said he makes it fun but he's also demanding and they they'll give it to him is what he said and so I think uh, I think this is gonna be fun. This is gonna be a lot of fun to watch uh, this team progress, both both the men's and women's teams. Because Vic Schaefer is as relentless a coach as I've ever been around, and and very similar to Chris Beard. So, um, all right, Taylor. With that being said, you ready for some uh, love it or leave it? Yes, I am. Before we get to love it or leave it, we're gonna take a really quick break, but stick around as uh, some more football talk continues here on the flagship podcast. So stay tuned. We will be right back. And if you're watching us on the Horns 24-7 YouTube channel, we will continue rolling on here to love it or leave it. Um, be sure that you are subscribing to all the Horns 24-7 podcasts um, on your favorite streaming device, whether it's iTunes, Spotify. Um, if you're over on iTunes, feel free to go ahead and give us a five-star rating and review and uh, Maybe, you know, just say some nice words for our boss. But also, uh, you want to head on over to youtube.com forward slash horns 24 7. Make sure you subscribe to the horns 24 7 YouTube channel there. Um, click the bell. You'll get all the notifications for the latest videos. And as we were talking about state of recruiting earlier, they also now are on the video platform as well. So uh, you'll have, you know, recruiting plus team stuff. You definitely want to stick around and we're going to be expanding that. But with that said, Chip, you ready for some love it or leave it? Let's go. All right. My first one for you is love it or leave it. Joshua Moore transferring from Texas is a huge blow for the Longhorns. You know, I'm going to leave this because it shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be. Not for Steve Sarkeesian. Um, and 
I've been saying now, I think for three straight weeks on this flagship podcast that it's clear they don't have a, a receiver like Jordan Whittington to go over the middle. So those catches need to go to the tight ends. I would look if Cade Brewers, your best blocking tight end, then send six foot seven Jared Wiley out across the middle to make those catches. If it means getting out of your comfort zone to redraw some plays, you know, I'm watching the Iowa State game, Taylor, and the tight ends are doing out routes. And I'm like, okay, first of all, I don't know that they have enough time for those routes to develop. And even when they were running Jordan Whittington on, you know, a lot of those crossing routes were like at 10 yards and in that takes time to develop the, the pass to Josh Moore against Iowa state that went for 24 yards was a two yard quick slant. Right. And he just took it and, you know, shot like a cannon. You can repackage your plays to take advantage of your talent. And I, I just think, You've got to you've got to get the tight ends more involved. They can catch. So and Jared Wiley is a is much better downfield than he is as an inline blocker. Get him involved. He should have he should have a game where he gets eight or nine targets right now. And and so we'll see about that. I mean, Bijan Robinson, we said, you know, he's got to be more involved in the passing game. He had eight catches Led against Iowa the State. Team. I mean, yeah, he had over half their offense, Taylor. Mm-hmm. Yep. He had a 20, 126 yards of offense. They only had 207 yards yeah. of total offense. I mean, you can't put it all on him. No, yeah. It, it's got to be spread around. And, you know, everyone wants to know, Keelan Robinson, Keelan, okay, you don't have the wide receivers anymore. Put Keelan Robinson in a two-back set with hopefully Bijan or Roshan. And, and then, you know, find a way to get him out on a route, run a two tight ends, two running backs uh, set and yeah. just find a way to get Keelan Robinson the ball. I mean, it's, you're not going to move him to receiver, obviously not at this point in the season, just get creative, get creative and, and, and show Kansas some stuff they haven't seen, get on them early and put them away because we know Kansas gave Oklahoma all they wanted, and you don't want your Texas team in a close game with Kansas in the fourth quarter this no. week because <laughs> the fans, everybody will be like, nope. And I might leave the press box if that happens. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. <laughs> yeah, you and I have covered some doozies against Kansas. I yes. was in Lawrence when Charlie, the Charlie Strong era basically came to an end, and uh, and I was there in 04 when Mark Mangino – you know, said it's about the BCS as to why uh, Texas, you know, he didn't get a call that he wanted. Um, anyway, Kansas has given Texas problems. Mm-hmm. Um, 2019. The last time Kansas came to Austin, they needed, 2019, a, dicker, yeah. <laughs> they needed a dicker field goal. What was it? The, Wasn't it like 48-45 or 51-48, yeah. something like that? Yeah, it was a three-point win. So it, <laughs> um, it is, yeah. How about you, yeah. Taylor? Um, yeah, you know, I'm I'm going to leave it. I feel like had you asked me this question prior to the season, I probably would say that it is a huge blow. Um, but, you know, the passing game right now and the it's just so inconsistent in general. So, while like obviously you want to have as many weapons as possible, I'm not really sure that unless it's a Xavier worthy transferring right now, I don't necessarily know if there's a receiver on Texas roster. That's really going to be one that you're like, Oh, this is the end of the season. You know, we're done, blah, blah, blah. I I don't necessarily think that. I think that there are guys that, you know, could step up. And as you mentioned, you kind of get creative, maybe do more 22 personnel type of, you know, two backs, two tight end sets. And, and Keelan Robinson, speaking of that, you know, he had three catches, I believe against, um, I was stay right three. Yeah. Three catches for 18 yards. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if you saw him be more involved since, you know, I oh, know I'm sorry. That's not true. I was looking at the wrong one. He had one catch for two yards. I was looking at his rushing stats, but anyway, I mean, they have thrown him the ball before. I think that that would be a good person to get more involved. And, you know, Marcus Washington and Calvante Dixon really just need to step up more. Um, but Overall, you know, I think that Texas does have some good recruits coming in from the receiver 
You know, they have Brennan Thompson, the four-star wide receiver out of Spearman, Texas. He's the number 81 overall prospect in the 2022 class, number 15 overall prospect in the state of Texas. They have Armani Winfield from Louisville, another four-star. He's a number 32 ranked in the state of Texas. I think he's the number 25 uh, receiver in the class where Brennan Thompson's number 11 receiver overall in 2022 class. So there's some guys coming in already. Um, you know, obviously I don't know what the deal or what the latest is with Evan Stewart. Mike Roach did tweet or uh, did report earlier today in the stampede that he went on a visit to a and and it looks like the Aggies may have done a pretty good job there. But still, I mean, there there's talent coming in. Um, and I think that there are enough guys on this current roster to kind of put a band-aid over the position a little bit. It's just going to be a matter of the Texas staff getting more creative with who they're distributing the ball to in the passing game. Yeah. And, and whatever the reason has been for Calvante Dixon, not to get more targets, uh, Calvante Dixon had a huge game for Texas on special teams against Iowa state, blocking a punt, downing a punt at the one. Um, he's a guy who, they they got to coach up. I mean, I've said it. It's like, okay, whatever he's not doing, coach him to do it. You know, if he's not running his routes at the right depth, um, because Steve Sarkeesian does tell his, you know, his offense a lot of times is throwing to a spot. Yeah. And it's a clock in the quarterback's head. It's one, two, three. I'm throwing to that spot unless I see, you know, something has gone horribly wrong and you better be in that spot. And we talked about it last week. Josh Moore was supposed to sit down in the middle of the zone against Baylor when, you know, the pass that went through his hands, it looked like it was behind him. Mm -hmm. It was because Moore was drifting and he was supposed to sit down. And, and so, you know, those are the little details that end up being big, right? Cause that pass went through his hands, gets intercepted when they're, uh, you know, in Baylor's half of the field. So, um, I agree the game with of inches you. for the re for a reason, you know, right. it literally is like, it's right. not, and, and, that's not coach speak. It's real. <laughs> right. And Calvante Dixon's made some big third down catches already this year. He's, he's a guy, they, they, you know, listen, you don't get the nickname Moochie unless everybody <laughs> on the team likes you. Right. What does that even mean? I don't even I don't know, know what Moochie means. But they call him Moochie. I mean, and you think that's a good thing. I don't know what it means. Yeah. Unless <laughs> no, he just mooches everybody's. <laughs> <laughs> food or something but um anyway all right love it or leave it number two all right my second one for you is love it or leave it texas tight end Cade brewer was right when he said that the team needs to have more fun yes i mean to me this is like i mean taylor i watched those players walk off the field in Ames, and i told you two years ago i've never seen sam ellinger more upset than mm -hmm. when Tom Herman didn't trust him to throw the football coming out of their own end. And they went three and out. And after he just led like a 14 play and 18 play drive to get them back in the game when he's throwing it everywhere, this team walked off the field, like someone had run over them. I mean, mm -hmm. they were despondent, like normally the energy, you know, and I talked to a couple sources about this, you know, they've, their, their energy was more positive. It was not positive coming off the field at Iowa state. It was, it was demoralized. Mm -hmm. And so whatever Steve Sarkeesian can do to get these guys to reconnect with their love of the game. And, you know, he talks all the time about tuning out social media. Listen, it's louder than it's ever been. Right. Because there's, there's jokes that are being made. There's everything. I mean, if you want to get down, and feel bad, you just go to social media and you can find it all. Right. It's a lot of it from their own fans. Whatever Sarkeesian can do to get these guys to reconnect with their love of the game and have fun, uh, that's that's enormously important right now because, I mean, Cade Brewer said it, and I, I'm sure it'll end up being bulletin board material at Kansas, but... I don't think he meant it that way. He said, uh, he said, I think the fight's still there. Losing four straight, it's tough on us. It's tough to bounce back from it. But we've got to get our confidence back, and this is a great week to do it. Mm -hmm. And this team does need to feel what it's like to win again and to get there. I do think they need to have fun, play loose. Yeah. Yeah. How about you? 
I agree. Before I get to that point, I want to, I'm curious for your take real quick. Would you say that the way the team left the Iowa state game this year was similar to the way that they left the Iowa state game in 2015? Remember that no. one? Oh, in 2015, the 24 to nothing game. Yeah. Oh yeah. Same similar. Yeah. Okay. I just yeah. was curious. Because, I hadn't asked you about that. You know, we've talked about this, the, the things that Texas was doing well, like in the game against OU scoring a, a bunch of points, you know, the offense, even getting off to the fast starts, um, you know, this time the offense didn't get off to a fast start. It, it was horrible. Yeah, it was, it, you know, it, we're comparing it to the, the three and out a thon, uh, under Charlie, when they went to Notre Dame and had, you know, nine, three and outs, they had, they had nine, three and outs again in this game. And yeah. it, it was, yeah, very similar. Okay. So there's, there, you got to get those heart paddles out. And <laughs> boom, Shock them and back then, in. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, watch Ted Lasso together or something. I don't know. Yeah. But yeah, they got to have some fun. Okay. So yeah, I, I agree. Um, you know, when I think that when fans may hear this, they may be like, no, they just need to win. You know, you don't want to hear about a team having fun when they're on a four game losing streak. But I think that probably is it. I mean, you know, when people are losing the first thing that really is hard to erase is like the frustrations and trying to do things that are maybe not even there, you know, and forcing plays, uh, trying to, you know, instead of trusting your preparation, you know, trying to do something else and not, you know, be in your gap, whatever it may be. I mean, there's a lot of things that can come into the equation if players aren't having fun and if they're just, you know, worried and they're playing worried or they're playing to hope to win. Steve Sarkeesian talked about that, that, you know, you don't want to play to hope to win. You want to play believing that you are going to win because you have to believe in, your preparation, you have to believe in your training, you have to believe that you can make the plays. Um, Because if you're hoping you're going to, then you're going to set yourself up for a disappointment. And yeah, I think that in that belief, you have to also have some fun. It's a game for a reason. I know that Texas fans, you know, it's, it's a a lifeblood for a lot of them. And I, I understand it's, I mean, shoot, it's our lifeblood, you know, covering this program. So I get it. But um, yeah, I think that without fun, you're going to, probably see a lot more bad performances. And so whatever I agree with you, whatever they have to do to get these guys, you know, um, being happy and looking forward to playing football is probably key. Cause I'd imagine on a four game losing streak, probably, you know, might not want to go out and play <laughs> if it's a, uh, you know, kind of doom and gloom. So yeah, I agree. I'm going to love this and say they need to have more fun, especially this week against Kansas. Yeah. And I, and I think it is important to remember these players are, they're out there giving it everything, you know, they've got, I think they're mm-hmm. confused too. Yeah. You know, cause they're, they're trying to execute what's called. They have with the exception of the Iowa state game, gotten off to great starts, great energy um, have even in those, you know, first three losses of this four game losing streak. They, as I told you the amount of time that they led in those games, I mean, it's not like they're just going out there and, and losing 66 to three, like in 97, when UCLA rolled into town and basically ended the John Makovic era. So, you know, I think Moro Jomo, he said, I just hope our fans know how much we love this university and how, you know, this losing is, is the hardest on us. Cause we're the ones putting in the time and work and blood, sweat and tears to try to, to get out there and get a win. So all right, Taylor, uh, love it or leave it, number three. All right, my final one for you is, after seeing Kansas play a close game against Oklahoma, Texas could lose if they don't take the Jayhawks seriously. Love it or leave it. Yeah, I mean, Texas, I'm going to love this because, and I'm not trying to be a smart ass here, but Texas has had, we, we mentioned it earlier, they've had some close calls with Kansas teams you would think should have been ho-hum games. And you can look at the stats mm-hmm. and the scores and say, Chip, shut up. This is ridiculous. Kansas is like last in every significant statistical category in the Big 12. They're last in scoring offense. They only score 15.1 points per game. They're last in scoring defense. They give up 42.8 
points per game and they're last in rush defense. They give up 250 yards per game rushing. But Oklahoma was leading 28 to 23, went for it on fourth down with Kennedy Brooks. This is the play of the year. Kennedy Brooks is getting tackled. He's going backwards and Caleb Williams rips the ball out of his hands and goes and runs to convert the fourth down. Otherwise, Kansas would have had the ball at midfield down by five with two minutes to play. Yeah. So that's the only film that Texas players need to watch this week to know that. And Mauro Jomo said, it's the big 12. Anything can happen from week to week. And, and so, yeah, I'm going to love this. I mean, especially with Texas's confidence where it is, this is a dangerous game for a totally different reason than any of the previous four games against highly ranked or highly, you know, thought of opponents, big 12 contending opponents. Let's put it that way. This is a dangerous game because this is a game you absolutely should come out with great energy and dominate. And you just heard Cade Brewer say, we got to get our confidence back because mm. they didn't come right out and get a quick start against Iowa state. So I'm going to love this Taylor. How about you? Yeah, I'm going to love it too. And I'm just going to put this out there, Chip. Obviously, Texas did not play Kansas in 2020. That game was canceled due to um, Kansas COVID-19 issues. In 2020, or excuse me, 2019 and 2018, Texas beat Kansas. And in both those games combined, they beat them by a combined nine points. They beat them by seven in 2018 and two in 2019. So... If history is shown, it's don't overlook Kansas because that 2018, I, I think that was the game right before the Big 12 title game. And they were, I mean, it was a, it was a Texas won by a touchdown in that game and they went to play for a Big 12 title. I mean, overlooking Kansas is probably the worst thing you could possibly do. Charlie Strong knows that too. Um, so yeah. Yeah, there it, were people who wanted Herman gone after the 2019 game where Dicker kicked that last second field goal to win by two. Oh yeah, people basically people point to that game as why Herman should have fired his whole defensive staff. Like literally, I mean, I I was talking to a journalist recently about it, talking about the defense and Todd Orlando, and he brought that up, and I was kind of like, so one game, like one game, and he said they should fire everybody, like you know, but but yeah, I mean, that was that was it, it was shocking, and it's very you know, Tom Herman probably would have been fired in 2019 if they lost. Like you can't lose to Kansas, and you know keep your job. I think it's kind of hard to do uh, as Charlie Strong knows too. But yeah, I mean, obviously Texas has played Kansas close seeing that Oklahoma game um, where Kansas honestly probably should have won the game. Uh, that, was, that was one of the best, most heads up plays by Caleb Williams. I didn't even know you could do that, but you can, you know? So, I mean, talk about a heads up play there. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, you know, if Texas, overlooks them or doesn't take this game seriously, then yeah, obviously this is a game they could lose because Oklahoma almost lost this game just a few weeks ago. Yeah. Um, and we should mention real quick, Taylor, before we sign off, uh, congratulations to Joey McGuire, uh, the, the associate head coach at Baylor, longtime successful Texas high school coach who uh, is now the head coach at Texas Tech. This, this is an interesting decision from Kirby Hocutt and and one, I think, um, you know, you got to have a good culture fit. And I think Joey McGuire uh, gets it and is going to be able to relate. And um, we'll see if the Texas Tech fan base, because this is the problem in college football, Taylor. LSU's going through it. USC's going through it. When you have a fan base that's so used to winning, that's in the top, uh, in the top 10 all time in wins. And and the expectation is, is conference titles. There's no patience mm -hmm. and, and everyone wants change and change is the reason Texas is in this hole. Yep. So many different coordinators. We talked about it today. You know, if you, you know, I want staff changes. Okay. Well, <laughs> Steve Sarkeesian needs to be allowed to make that decision. No one right. needs to be walking into Steve Sarkeesian's office and saying, uh, to keep our fans happy, you're going to have to fire somebody. You know, yeah. you, you've got to let him run the show for three years. You paid $25 million to get rid of Tom Herman and his staff. 
you got to give Steve Sarkeesian time. And, Absolutely. And no one wants to hear that either, but it, that's that's the case. And yeah. And hopefully the Texas Tech fan base will give Joey McGuire time because, um, you know, we're still waiting to see who TCU's head coach is going to be. I, I I know they're going after my, uh, well, the head coach at my alma mater, Sonny Dykes. Sonny we'll Dykes, see if yeah. <laughs> Sonny says yes. But um, anyway, thanks for listening, everybody. Make sure you listen to our uh, flagship podcast interview previewing Texas, Kansas. We promise there will be some Texas uh, and Kansas basketball in there as well. Because <laughs> Kansas and Texas are the uh, top two selections by the media to finish one, two, Kansas, one, Texas, two in the preseason media poll for basketball. So for Taylor Estes, I am Chip Brown. We'll see you over at horns 247com and uh, don't forget to subscribe to the Horns 24-7 YouTube channel. Until next time, thanks for listening and stay safe and keep the faith.